Hi, Integrated Math One. Welcome to lesson 2.3.3 A. We're back in the Carnegie book. So I hope you've got your book. I hope you've got it open to page M2-187. Because that's where we are today. Yay. We do have a warm up. We're not going to do all of these. Um, I think there's like six of them on your page. We're only going to do the first three. We're just going to do the first couple. And what I would like you to do, la la, what I would like you to do is determine if each point is a solution to y is greater than x, y is less than x, or y equals x. So I basically just want you to determine is the y coordinate greater than your x coordinate? Is the y coordinate less than your x coordinate? Or is your y coordinate equal to your x coordinate? So go ahead, hit pause, work your way through these, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So, um, we know how this goes. I'm going to grab my pen here. We know how this goes. We know this is the x coordinate. We know this is the y coordinate. So, I do want the y coordinate in front. So, I'm going to say negative 2 and I'm going to compare it to 8. Well, negative 2 is less than 8. So, I would say that y is less than x. So, this point is a solution to y is less than x. Yay. And if we keep going, right, again, I have an x coordinate, I have a y coordinate. And so 7 is greater than 0, so in this case, y is greater than x. Yay. And last but not least, I have an x-coordinate, I have a y-coordinate, they're both negative 1. So I would say negative 1 equals negative 1, so my y-coordinate equals my x-coordinate. So that wasn't so bad. I mean, once you wrap your head around it, it wasn't that bad at all. But We've spent the last little bit, um, before we went on break, we spent some time working on systems of equations. Um, but remember when we did solved equations, we also solved inequalities. So let's start bringing inequalities back into all of this. So we're going to be graphing inequalities in two variables. Now, previous to this, we graphed inequalities on a number line, right? We were like, that's our solution. It goes on a number line. Hooray. Um, but now we're actually going to use graphs and graph paper and all that good stuff. So we're going to be graphing inequalities in two variables, x and y. So we have some learning goals throughout the next, two, uh, next couple of days here. We're going to write an inequality in two variables. We're going to graph an inequality in two variables on a coordinate plane. You guys know how to graph lines on a coordinate plane, on a coordinate plane graph. We'll play with doing that with inequalities now as well. It's very similar with a few little differences. Determine, oh, we also get to determine whether we're going to use a solid or dashed boundary line to graph our inequality on the coordinate plane. Remember how we had open circles and closed circles? Yeah, similar idea. Solid boundary line or a dashed boundary line. Very similar idea here. And of course, we're going to interpret the solutions of inequalities mathematically and also in the context of real world problems, right? We always got to bring real world problems into this. So today we've got two key terms, half plane and boundary line. Those are going to be appearing. They're pretty simple, but we need to know what they are and what we're talking about when they show up. So you've graphed linear inequalities in one variable, right? You just did it on a number line and you had an open circle or closed circle and you colored either to the right or to the left. So what does the graph of a linear inequality in two variables look like when I have an x and a y? And how does that compare to the graph of a linear equation on a coordinate plane? So like I said, there's some similarities, but there's some key differences as well. Just to get our head into the game here on page 188, we have our little getting started activity um, with, our, with these different statements. These all mean something a little different, right? We have x equals 2, x is less than 2, x is greater than 2, x is less than or equal to 2, x is greater than or equal to 2. Can you just real quick um, just discuss with somebody or maybe make some notes, can you compare all of these five different solution statements? What exactly does each one mean? Go ahead and hit pause, talk to somebody or jot down your thoughts, and then hit play to keep going. So let's start with x equals 2. Um, x equals 2 means the value 2 is the only solution, right? 2 is the only solution here. If x equals 2, the only thing x can be is 2. That's it. But if I'm looking at x is less than 2, 
That means that any value less than two is a solution, right? One would be a solution, zero, uh, x could be one, x could be zero, x could be negative 374. Anything, any value less than two can be a solution. It's a possibility for x. So if I say x is less than or equal to two, then that means the value two and values less than two are solutions, right? If we're talking about values greater, x is greater than 2, um, then that means values greater than 2 are solutions. So 3 or 4.7 or 2.39 or 576, all of those are possible solutions. x could be any of those. So when x is greater than 2, values greater than 2 are solutions, which means when we see x is greater than or equal to 2, that means the value 2 and values greater than 2 could be solutions. So 2 could now be a solution as well because of that little half an equal sign. Okay, so now that we've got our head in the game with these inequalities, let's go ahead and move on to our first activity on page M2-189. So Coach Purvis is analyzing the scoring patterns of players on his basketball team. Benna is averaging 20 points per game from scoring on two and three point shots. By the way, Steph Curry, rock on. He hit his three point, he hit the all time three point scoring record, right? Impressive. Now, as Coach Purvis is analyzing, he's noticing a few things. He, she's averaging 20 points per game. So, question A. If she scores six two-point shots and two three-point shots, will she meet her points per game average? Go ahead and hit pause, just do the math real quick, and then hit play to keep going. So six two-point shots would be six times two, and two three-point shots would be two times three. And of course, six times two, so the six two-point shots would be 12, and two times three for her three-point shots would be six, if we add those together, that's a total of 18 points. So in this situation, no, she's not going to meet her points per game average. Um, if her average is 20 points per game, she's not going to hit that on that game. So part B, if she scores seven two-point shots and two three-point shots, will Benna meet her points per game average? Hit pause, do the math, and hit play to check your work. All right, seven two-point shots, so seven times two, two three-point shots, so two times three. Um, seven times two is 14, two times three is six. If we add those together, okay, yeah, yeah, she'll hit her average, 20 points, sure. So in this situation, Benna will meet her 20 points per game average. Next, one more, one more. C, um, if she scores seven two-point shots and four three-point shots, well, Benna meet her points per game average. You probably already know, but go ahead and hit pause, work out the math, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So seven times two for the two-point shots, four times three for the three-point shots. That's 14 plus 12, which is 26. Yeah, she will, she will exceed her average of 20 points per game at this point in time, won't she? Most definitely. Um, let's keep the party going. Let's write an equation to represent that. Uh, can we write an equation to represent the number of two-point shots and the number of three-point shots that would total 20? Um, just go ahead and hit pause, write down an equation for this, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So, I'm going to let X represent the number of two-point shots, and I'm going to let Y represent the number of three-point shots. And so we know two-point shots are two points each, so I'll say two times X. And I know three-point shots, obviously, are three points each, so I'll say three times Y. And together, I want them to add up to 20. So now I have this lovely equation, hooray, huzzah, and happy day. But of course, I want you to graph it. So let's come over here to page M2-189. Hopefully it's where you still are. I would like you to graph the equation that you wrote on the coordinate plane. So this lovely graph. Now I will warn you, it's probably easiest 
to get into the slope intercept form. You might want to get into Hawaii equals mx plus b form, so you might want to start by solving for y. Go ahead, hit pause to work this out, hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, let's do this. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for y. So I'm going to subtract from 2x, subtract 2x on both sides. And I have 3y equals negative 2x plus 20. I'm going to go ahead and divide by 3, divide by 3. Everybody gets divided by 3. And so now I have y equals negative 2 thirds x and, uh, oh dear, 20 divided by 3. That's not nice. Um, I think that I'm going to, I think I'm going to estimate that. That ends up being what, um, 6 and 2 thirds. So it's not going to be pretty to graph, but that's all right. We'll make it work. So my y-intercept, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 2 thirds. My y-intercept is going to be about there, roughly. And, of course, my slope, negative 2 over 3. So I'm going to go down 2, 1, 2, and over 3, 1. Ooh, ooh dear. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. Sorry, I got a little carried away there. And then, of course... I will connect the dots. Um, hang on, I'm going to zip through a few things here. We don't need all that junk, but I am going to go ahead and connect my dots. There it is. So yay, we graphed the equation. It wasn't the prettiest thing ever, but we did it. Now, there's a reason why we did that. Hang on, I'm going to do this real quick. There's a reason why we did this. Um, Coach Purvis, so we're on the next page there on page M2-190, just right next to the graph. Coach Purvis believes that Danvers High School can win the district playoffs if Bennis scores at least 20 points per game. So how can you rewrite the equation you wrote in question two, right? Our whole like 2x plus 3y equals 20. How could we rewrite that to represent that Bennis must score at least 20 points per game? Go ahead, hit pause, put a little thought into that, and then hit play to keep the discussion going. So here's my thinking. Um, I don't want it to be an equation. I don't want an equal sign. I need to rewrite the equation to show that the two-point baskets and three-point baskets Bennis scores must be equal to or greater than Ben is 20 points per game average. So on part B, can you write that inequality? Can you write an inequality that represents the situation? Go ahead and hit pause, write it down, hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, so we said we have um, two points and then her three points, and we don't want it to equal 20 this time. I mean, it can equal 20, but we want it to be at least 20 points. So we actually want this to be greater than or equal to 20, right? Um, if we want to get to the district playoffs, Ben has got to score at least 20 points. She's got to score equal to or greater than 20 points every game. No pressure, right? Right. <laughs> um, so what does this mean about the solutions of the inequality on our graph? Right? It's a line, but we said we don't want her to just score 20. We want her to also possibly score more than 20. So what would that look like on the graph? Go ahead and hit pause. Just give that a little bit of thought and then hit play to keep going. What this means is that line that we just graphed is actually a boundary between the points that are solutions and are not solutions, right? Because we want her, that, that we, we made that line, right? We made that line, that lovely graph, and we want her to score at least that graph, if not more than that graph. So it's not just a matter of what's on the line. That means everything above that line would also be a solution, right? Any combination of two and three point baskets that's above that line is going to be a solution. So here's what I would like you to do. Can you go back to the graph that we did on the other page? And can you shade the side of the graph that contains all the combinations of shots 
that are greater than or equal to Benna's points per game average. Go ahead and hit pause, graph that, shade that side real quick, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. Um, I'm going to come back to the graph. Oh, there it is. And we said um, that we want Bennett to score above, right? Above. So I'm going to grab my highlighter here. And actually, I want a red highlighter. I want a red highlighter. So I'm going to highlight. And um, we said we want her to score above the 20. So anything above. So I'm going to shade this entire half of the graph, right? This entire half of the graph is going to get shaded in. And you can just use the side of your pencil. You can tell I'm just using a little highlighter here. Highlighters do a good job of this too, by the way. I like highlighters. And there we go. Anything on this side of the graph is going to be a solution to our situation, right? If Benna scores any combination of baskets that are up over here, she's scored over her 20-point average. She's done a good job. So rock on, Benna. Um, so how do the solutions of the equation differ from the solutions of the inequality? Well, the solutions of the equation are on the line, right? Any point on the line is a solution to the equation. But the solutions to the inequality are half of the coordinate plane, right? It's the whole half of the coordinate plane up above that line. So this brings us to some important definitions on page M2-192. The graph of a linear inequality in two variables is a half plane or half of a coordinate plane. And the boundary line determined by the inequality divides that plane into two halves. And the inequality symbol indicates which half plane contains all the solutions. And these solutions are represented by shading the appropriate half plane. So we take our inequality, we graph the line, that's the boundary line, right? And then the side that we shade is the half plane that represents all of our solutions. Um, so just a few quick notes. If the inequality symbol is less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, and this is important, I know it's tiny off to the side in your book, but I would, I would underline this highlighted or something. If the inequality symbol is less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, then the boundary line is a solid line. That little half equal sign is the equivalent of a closed circle, right? So I want a solid line because all the points on the line are part of the solution too. Now I'm going to grab another color here. If the symbol is less than or equal to, sorry, that's really dark. Let's not do that. That was too dark. Let's pick a lighter color. There we go. Is less than or greater than. So there's no squashed equal sign. Usually we would say an open circle. And in this case, I'm going to say it's a dashed boundary line because the points on the line also are, are not solutions this time. So it's very similar to that open circle, closed circle thing. If there's a squashed equal sign, if it includes the equal to, it's going to be a solid boundary line. If there's not a half equal sign, ooh, sorry about that. If there's not a half equal sign, it'll be a dashed line. So with that in mind, I would like you to consider the linear inequality. Y is greater than 4X minus 6. So the boundary line that divides the plane is determined by the equation y equals 4x minus 6. So I want you to answer a few questions here on page 192. First of all, should the boundary line in this graph be a solid line or a dashed line? Hit pause, jot down your thoughts, hit play to keep going. So just to remind us that's, uh, oh, hang on, I want my pen. That's y is greater than 4x minus 6. So because there's no half equal sign, because it's just greater than, it's not greater than or equal to, it's going to be a dashed line. Okay, so we're going to have a dashed line. So here's what I'd like you to do. I would like you to graph this inequality on the coordinate plane. Okay, graph this inequality on the coordinate plane. You already know it's a dashed boundary line at y equals 4x minus 6. So go ahead and hit pause and graph your dashed boundary line. 
hit pause to graph it, and then hit play to keep going, and we'll discuss which side to shave. Go. So to start off with, I'm just going to graph it. I know my y-intercept is negative 6, so I need to make a little dot Ooh, right there. I know my slope is 4 over 1, so I need to go up 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, over 1. Boop, put my little dot there. Now, when I make my line, we said it needs to be a dashed boundary line. So dash it all, there it is. Now, last step. We need to shade the half plane. Now, there are many ways of doing this, but here's Miss Scott's super easy trick. Are you ready? You remember how we said if x was greater than the stuff that we colored to the right because x was bigger, and we said if x was less than, we colored to the left because that was smaller. Take a look. Y. Okay? If y is greater than, I want to color all the stuff above. If y is less than, I'm going to shade all the stuff below. So what should we do here? Well, y is greater than this stuff. I know bigger means that from this dashed line is up. So I'm going to shade in everything up above. Whoa! And actually, I cheated. I used a whole little thing here. So this is the half plane I'm going to shade. And there it is. And you just graphed this inequality. It was a dashed line because it did not have an equal to. And because y was greater than, we just shaded up above it. Awesome. Last little bit, last little bit. Can you match these up by any chance? And then the one that's not graphed, um, can you graph it on D? Go ahead and hit pause, match these up, hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, A, I see a dashed line. The fact that it's dashed means it's one of these two guys on the bottom, right? There's no squashed equal sign. Um, I see it shaded up above, so Y should be greater than, oh, this is the one. That's A right there. Looking at B, B has a nice, sorry, my lights are funky. B has a nice solid line. So B is a nice solid line. So that means it has to be one of these two on the top because of their squashed equal signs. Um, I see it shaded below. Uh, since it is shaded below, I'm going to go ahead and pick this one because this is y is less than or equal to 1 half x minus 3. So that's going to be b. Next up we have c, which is a dashed line. Oh, pff, it has to be this guy, right? It's dashed line. It's shaded below. That's y is less than, which means this guy's going to have to be d, but we need to graph it. I know it's going to be a solid line, so am I going to make my line? It's the same line as the others. It's just it's going to be a solid one now. And it says y is greater than or equal to, so that means I need to shade above. So I did. Yay. As always, guys, I hope you found this helpful. I hope you found this useful. If you have questions or concerns, let me know. Come talk to me. You know I'm around. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye.